Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are a newcomer or you've been sitting in that back row and you enjoy what you're hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button and setting your notification bell to all. That way you don't miss any time I upload a video. A couple of days ago, I released a video entitled True Subscriber Horror Stories. Unbeknownst to me, there was a subscriber I left out by accident. Everyone brought it to my attention. So, I am kicking off today's video with that subscriber story, and then the rest of the video will be on topic. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Middle of Nowhere Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right before I start the stories, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. This story was written by Kim Walsh. It was the mid-80s, and the town I live in is in Canada. I worked for a reputable hotel chain as a night maid service. I would clean late checkouts and tend to customer requests to talk to the people at the front desk, and we had what they called day rates. It was for the ladies who would only stay an hour with a friend, to put it nicely. It was the Thursday evening, and I had two day rates and two late checkouts to clean, so I go about my business, I get to my second room, I knock on the door. Housekeeping, no reply. I knock again. Housekeeping. No reply. Then I let myself into the room, which we are allowed to do. I look around the room and notice there's a few personal items still left, but the room should have been empty two or three hours ago. I noticed the bathroom door was closed, and I started getting a funny feeling in my stomach. I go to the bathroom door and knock. Housekeeping. I announced, and again, knock, knock, housekeeping, no reply. For some reason, my stomach just did not feel right. I slowly opened the bathroom door and peeked in. The shower curtains were closed, and I watched a lot of scary movies, so I'm definitely frightened now. I do not want to step into the bathroom, so I grabbed my broom and used the handle to slowly open the curtain. There was a lady in the bathtub, full of water, cigarette butts in the bathwater, and a bottle of vodka on the side of the bathtub. I called out, Miss? Miss? Hello? Miss? Nothing. She didn't even flinch. I called her again very loudly, and still nothing, so I poked her with the broom handle in her shoulder, and her head just fell to the side. I ran out of that room so fast and down to the front desk and told the clerk what I had found. He got the night porter to go to the room to check it out. A few moments later, I hear over the walkie-talkie, you better call 911, this lady is deceased. I nearly hit the floor. Well, as you can imagine, I had to go home after that and couldn't finish my duties. I just could not stop shaking. A few days later, I had to call my boss and tell her there's no way I can come back to work there. She understood and said she would forward my last paycheck and give me a good reference. So now, I'm going to take you to 1992, seven years after my hotel horror. I found myself working at another reputable hotel chain in a different city as a front desk clerk. I was doing the night audit, so there's only three employees in the entire building between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. This particular night, the nightmare had called in sick, so it's just myself and the security guard. The hotel was almost to capacity, as there were sports teams of young-aged kids in competition for the week. There were two rooms that I had checked out a day before, 
they had reserved. So it was up to me to clean the rooms as we really needed them first thing in the morning. I went down to the hall closet and got the maid's card to push it down the hall to the first room. There had been an elderly couple staying there, so the room was quite tidy and took me less than 15 minutes to clean. I took a short break and then headed back upstairs to clean the second bedroom. I didn't even knock on the door because no one should have been in there, as the gentleman had already checked out. I go in, strip the bedding, get the garbage, pull the vacuum cleaner out, put the bed together. Then I head to the bathroom and the doors closed. I just stood there looking at the door, listening to see if I could hear anything. I heard nothing. I giggled to myself and opened the door, and the shower curtain was closed. As I said before, I watch a lot of scary movies, so I started to get nervous. I took a deep breath, stood up tall, walked into the bathroom, and flung that shower curtain open. Then I screamed really loud that there was a woman with a bottle of booze on the side of the tub. As soon as I saw a man's tie around her throat, I closed my eyes and backed out of the room and closed the door. Slowly, I walked down to the front desk. I couldn't believe what just happened, and I called the police to come and take care of it. The security guard stayed with me for the remainder of the four hours. The room didn't get completely cleaned, and that day, I quit my job at another horror hotel. This is a true story, and I never worked at a hotel again. No one has heard this story, so I thought I would share it with you and my experience at what happened to me when I was in my 20s a while back. This is probably going to be really long-winded, but this story requires some backstory, so I'll get to it. So this happened in 2011. For some reason, I can't get a direct link to the story because the local news website isn't working or at least the article about it isn't working, or it's broken or deleted or something. There is some mention of it online, and you can find people talking about it on forums and linking to the article, which appears broken or deleted, as I said. So before people start calling me out on for not providing a source, Google, body found at James A. Reed, and you'll find what I'm talking about. I live really close to James A. Reed. It's a memorial wildlife area of a little over 3,000 acres. It's a popular location for fishing because it has something like 12 small lakes or whatever. I consider them large ponds, really, but semantics. Hiking, as there are numerous hiking trails that traverse the entire area all of which are light hiking and nature walking sort of trails. It's a popular spot for photographers for shooting portraits, and during hunting season, it's popular for bow hunting. I'm an amateur photographer, I guess. I do portraiture for a side gig. I like to fish, and I also like to go hiking. So it's basically one of my favorite places and go there very often. I basically broke into portraiture photography by shooting school photos and couples and such at this location. It has fields with tall grass, great colors in the fall, docks, and easily accessible changes in scenery. It's basically a it's basically a photographic gold mine. I still do photography, but I'm quite a bit better known at this point and obviously significantly better than I used to be. But I still use James A. Reed as my go-to location for almost everything. Boy Scout troops also go hiking through the area on nature walks and such. It's just a very popular area. In the summer of 2011, the body of a 19-year-old guy was found at the wildlife park. They call it a wildlife park, but I mean the wild life amounts to like deer, fish, 
Lots of snakes, squirrels, and cranes. I've never really seen anything else there, and I've been there more times than I could ever count. Anyways, the story of this kid's body was a mirror news story, but since I was so familiar with the area, it was of interest to me. The news report was immediately confusing. According to the report, the kid had been partying with some friends and he OD'd at the party, and the story breaks apart here. His friends say that he wandered off and they didn't know where he went. His mother thinks, for no clear reason, and this is the operating story that the news went with, that he OD'd at this party and his friends dumped his body in the wildlife area in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere. Both of these things are pretty much impossible, and I'll explain exactly why right now. The article mentioned which lake his body was found near. It was Bodark Lake, which is pretty much the furthest lake from the entrance to the park that you can get to. Getting to this particular lake requires driving down about a mile and a half long paved road that hasn't had any service in like at least two decades. This thing is riddled with potholes that are car killers. If you don't know where they are, you have to take the road slow. Hitting one of these things and anything short of a full-size pickup will likely destroy your tire and wheel. I've driven it so many times I have the potholes memorized and can drive it pretty normally, weaving in and out of them when they come up. But in the dark of the night, this would be hard especially for some drunk or high teenagers. But that in and of itself isn't impossible to do. There are three gates between the entrance where his body was found. One right at the driveway leading into the park, which is one of the large swinging steel gates. The next gate is just after that one. In order to get to Bodark, you need to make an immediate right-hand turn after the visitor center and that is where you run into the 10-foot-tall chain-link fence that's meant to keep the deer in the wildlife area. This fence runs the entire perimeter of the reserve as it's right off of a highway, and they want to make sure the deer stay there for hunting season. You need to get through a second chain-link fence gate that's chained shut every night. The park opens at sunrise and closes at sunset. After you go through the gate, you get on the previously mentioned paved road for about three minutes and come to what they constitute as the ranger station, but it's really just a big parking lot. From here, there is another giant fence gate that is chained shut every night. After you're through that gate, you're in the clear to get to Bodark Lake. The trail near Bodark is particularly scenic, and I've used it countless times for photo shoots. It's also a good walk through nature. So, the next day, my girlfriend and I decided we'd go check it out, see if we could find where they found the body. I know, that's very disrespectful, but we were gonna go there anyway, so why not? Well... We did find where they found the body. We knew this because the police tape was still there. But it was one fuck of a chore. In order to get to where the body was found, you had to start on the trail near Bodark. But about five minutes into the walk, go completely off the path and through the trees and brush, down an extremely steep slope that goes downward about 20 feet and cross through the stream at the bottom. The stream was about three to four feet deep, as it was running high, though the water doesn't move very fast. The only reason we knew where we were going was because the original trail was high enough up that through the trees, we caught the glint of yellow caution tape way in the distance. When hiking, we both wore a pair of Vibram hiking shoes that didn't have trouble with water. Yes, the ones with toes. But the water was still deep 
and we didn't particularly want to go swimming, so we walked upstream for quite a while until we found a section that was thin enough to jump across. Mind you, we walked upstream about 10 minutes before we found this, and then walked back down the stream to where we had been to continue in the direction of the caution tape, which we could no longer see now that we were on level with it. After a few more minutes of trudging through particularly thick brush and forestry, we finally arrived at the second stream, on the other side of which was the roped-off area of police tape. The actual taped-off area was pretty small, so we were able to tell pretty much exactly where the body was found. It was on a pile of rocks right on the other side of the stream. We didn't cross the stream because we'd found it, and that was good enough. There was nothing to see. We'd gone from a class zero nature walk to a class two at times, and then class three hiking to get here. There was absolutely zero possibility of any drunken teenagers carrying a human body this far into the wilderness in the middle of the night and this is after they bypassed the three gates, which were never reported to have been broken into at all. This kid was way off the beaten path and was very literally in the middle of the wilderness. It was so remote that his body was here for a couple of days before anyone found it. I've done a lot of thinking, and even completely sober, in the middle of the day, this was a serious challenge to get to. It's equally impossible that he just wandered away from some party in the middle of the night and found himself here. There are houses along the highway across from James A. Reed, most of which are farms. And if you go a couple miles down that highway, you do find a residential area. But the notion that he got fucked up, wandered miles down the road, hot too. 10-foot fences, walked a mile down a barely paved road, went into the forest, crossed two deep streams, sat down on a pile of rocks, and decided to OD in the middle of the forest is equally, if not more, unlikely. So, what happened to him? I don't know. I think it's a lot more likely they went into the forest during operating hours and all started doing drugs in the middle of the forest, and they left him, unfortunately, where he died. But still, this is a massive stretch. I cannot stress to you the difficulty of getting to this location. Anyway, why is this on the paranormal board? It should be on the this-sounds-like-some-really-bad-police-work board. But I'm getting there, I swear. So... We started our retreat back to the actual trail, climbing through the trees and brush, which was now significantly more difficult because we were going uphill back to the first stream. And after that, it was a steep incline, which was definitely going to require grabbing trees and getting firm footholds and some teamwork. But before we got that far, we had to trek back upstream to get to the point where we could jump across it. And right here is where it got fucking weird. As we're following the stream up, we stopped dead in our tracks as a middle-aged man in a full business suit was just walking in the stream. He was a really tall dude. The water came up to right around his chest he was in a white dress shirt, a black blazer, black tie, and he had a briefcase in his hand that he was kind of letting float behind him. He was walking downstream, so coming directly toward us, but paid us no mind. We both just stopped and stared at the guy, and then at each other, as if to silently say, What the fuck? And both of us backed up as he got closer to us. He passed us by without saying anything or even looking in our direction. He was... Yeah, well, he was bald, white, 
probably around 45 years old and fairly broad. He had a completely blank expression, and he looked like he hadn't slept in days. He had massive bags under his eyes, which were completely dead. His expression was just dead. Slightly slack-jawed, eyes glossed over. It's worth noting he was dry from the chest up, like he just entered the water and started walking downstream. He was just walking straight down the stream very slowly. We just stood there, completely silent, staring at this guy until he passed us by, and we were now looking at the back of his head as he marched forward. He could have easily exited the water at any point. The embankment wasn't very difficult, but he just soldiered on down the stream. We now moved way faster than we safely should have been running upstream to jump across and get back on the trail into our car, where we drove off and both immediately started asking each other what the fuck that was. We tried to tell our friends about this experience, but it was beyond even really conveying how weird this was. I don't even think I can properly put it into text to give you the proper context as to how fucking eerie it really was. It was just dead silent in the forest, or at least it seemed that way. All we heard was him sloshing through the water as he slowly made his way down the stream to wherever the hell he was going. I expected to read about another body being found, like this guy was off to hang himself in the forest or something, but no such news article ever appeared. But the vibe he gave off, like, man, I really can't explain the feeling that seeing this guy gave us. It was like overwhelming dread, confusion, and I'm sure some terror. I really don't even know how to explain the emotions we were feeling, and we both agreed we didn't even have words for it. It was a total foreign feeling. Anyway, I don't really have any other notable paranormal experiences out in the middle of nowhere. I don't know about ghosts or any of that shit. So, I'm asking you, out of curiosity, what the hell do you think we came across out there? I know I probably didn't need all that backstory to the dead body, but it's a weird case that locals generally feel was not sufficiently answered because anyone familiar with the area and location will tell you exactly what I just did. That both accounts of how we got there are basically impossible. So were the body and the businessmen in the river related or did we just stumble upon something else while out looking for the location? Who or what do you think this dude was? I want to tell you it was just a guy randomly walking down a stream of disgusting murky water in a business suit, because weirder things have happened, but I cannot shake the feeling of this guy and the vibe he gave off. I would really like to know what you think. Hello everyone, this specific story that I would like to share is one that's passed down to me from my late grandfather. The circumstances are so unusual, so unlike anything I have ever heard, that it's been in the back of my mind for nearly 20 years, ever since it was first told to me when I was a child. My granddad was a great talker and storyteller in his own way and my family agrees that he wouldn't mind if I shared it with others. This story, as incredible as it may sound, is completely true. The look on my grandfather's face every time he told this story, well, you can tell that it shook him up. First, I'll need to give you a little background. My granddad was born in the early 20s in a dirt-floor, two-room farmhouse in rural South Carolina, 
an only child of sharecroppers during the Great Depression. He was a premature baby, and his parents, already having lost one infant, were understandably protective of him. I'm sure they were relieved and very happy that he was a strong and healthy child, albeit with an incredible amount of wanderlust. Restless and energetic, he almost always finished his chores as quickly as he could so that he could take up his little fishing rod and roam to his heart's content. Back then, even horse-drawn carts were a rarity on those long dirt roads. Cars were practically unheard of in that part of the country in those days. Disliking horses, but still greatly desiring to put as much distance between home and himself as he could, in the span of an afternoon, my granddad had little choice other than to walk. And walk he did. He combed through miles of woods, fields, and swampland, barefoot as the day he came into this world, heedless of brambles or snakes. They wouldn't bother him if he didn't bother them. As much as he enjoyed it, it was a lonely business. His father was a hell man, but with acres of land to help tend, as well as livestock, he hardly had the time to join his son on his walks. Sometimes one of the local boys would go with him, but that wasn't often. So, being practically kin to everyone within a 30-mile radius, my granddad took up the grand old southern tradition of going visiting. One of his favorite places to go was to Uncle Peter's. Uncle Peter lived on one of the branches of the lake that stretched across a goodly portion of the county. It was a tiny shack, hardly more than a shanty and barely big enough to fit both him and his spinster sister, Henrietta, but they may do. Now, Uncle Peter loved to talk about as much as he loved to fish, so when he would spot my granddad coming up the dirt track towards the house, he'd put whatever he was working on aside. Aunt Henrietta was prone to give him the stink eye for this, but she was fond of my granddad too, so she never said anything. It became a tradition of sorts for my grandfather to put a spare shirt in a sack, along with a treat of some kind that his mother made, and head off for Uncle Peter's every other weekend. He did this for years, right up until he married my grandmother. Usually it was about dark when he'd set off, meaning it was well after sunset before he got there. The distance between his house and Uncle Peter's being in the reckoning of about six or seven miles. You know, middle of nowhere. Granddad tended to stay through Sunday, heading home after evening supper, which tended to be on the table well after dark. Suffice to say, there wasn't much to be afraid of back then, other than the local wildlife. And as I said before, as long as you minded your own business, they minded theirs. He'd been walking through the countryside at night all his life. He was comfortable and felt safe. As had become habit throughout the years, Granddad kissed Aunt Henrietta goodbye, shook Uncle Peter's hand, and started home at a brisk pace. It was autumn, so the air was pleasantly cool, a welcome relief from summer's oppressively humid heat. He said that there was a full moon that night, and when he would walk out in the open, it was fairly well lit. He could easily see where he was going. The dirt track that led away from Uncle Peter's shack meandered through a bit of marshland before it ended at the wider road. Usually, he didn't take that route unless he felt like a bit of a wander, since cutting through the fields and woodland was a straight shot back to his parents' farmhouse and the road slithered and slunk its way through the far side of the lake before curving back in the direction of home. That night, however, with the moonlight and the refreshing nip in the wind, Granddad felt the urge to do a bit of meandering. Turning at the end of the path, he stepped onto the road, barefoot as a jaybird, and softly whistling to himself. 
The route was so familiar that he hardly paid any attention to the surroundings, letting his feet do most of the work while he occupied himself with other thoughts. Before he knew it, he was approaching the lake. The water was calm that night, still and dark. He slowed down a little, wanting to watch the way the light rippled and shimmered gently. It was such a pretty sight that he nearly missed what was standing not far up the road. At first, it was just a silhouette, a tall and solid-looking shadow that seemed to be facing the water. Granddad thought it might have been a trick of the light initially. He walked through his cemetery once in the middle of the night and thought he'd seen a soldier riding a white horse until he'd gotten closer and realized it was just a large dewdrop spider web. As he drew nearer, he quickly realized it wasn't his eyes. There was something standing on the side of the road. In fact, it was a man. He could tell by the build broad-shouldered and narrow at the hip, and he could tell by the clothes. Even in the moonlight, it was evident that the man wore a dark suit that did not fit him well. A shapeless hat was on his head, causing his form to appear elongated and odd-looking. From the distance of several feet, Granddad could see the shine of good shoes, polished until they picked up the water's gleam. The man was standing close to the water, so close, in fact, that the waves were lapping at those expensive-looking shoes. The lake's shifting reflection softly illuminated his face, and Granddad could make out strong features that have been weathered with time and toil. The lines around his mouth and eyes were distinctive as he smiled. That was when Granddad realized that the man was smiling at him. In fact, the man had been staring at him just as long, or longer, as Granddad had been doing the same. Quickly remembering his manners, he greeted the man politely. The man's expression didn't change as his head turned to follow my Granddaddy's movement until he stopped on the other side of the road. A little unnerved, my grandfather stood awkwardly for a long moment, waiting for what he thought would be the appropriate amount of time for a reply. The man didn't speak. His face never changed, but he slowly brought his hand up and made a beckoning motion with his fingers, silently asking my granddad to come closer. Granddad shook his head. No, sir, I can't stay and talk. I have to get home. You have a nice night. Dipping his head, my granddad started walking again, passing the strange man with a slightly quicker pace than he'd been walking before. Feeling like he was being watched, he stopped again a little further up the road. He turned to look back to see the man had turned around so that he was facing the direction my granddad was going, still staring at him. But now, he was waist deep in the water. Confused and shocked, Granddad could only gape at the man as he stood in the lake, that same grin on his face as he lifted his hand and beckoned again. Shaking his head quickly, my Granddad repeated what he had said, the words out of his mouth before he could even think about how weird they sounded now. N no, sir, I can't stay and talk. I have to get home. You have a nice night. He whipped around and started walking even faster up the road, listening for the sound of splashing or footsteps behind him. But there was nothing. And that was when it struck him. He'd never heard a sound. No splash, no drip, no scuffle of shoes against dirt. Silence. Closing in on the trees, he felt a shiver run down his back as the feeling of being watched washed over him again. He froze on the spot. Everything in him was telling him to just keep walking and not to stop until he was through his mother's kitchen door. But 
there was an even stronger urge to turn around to look back one more time. The compulsion was too much to resist. He turned again to look at the lake. The man was still there, only now he was further in. The water was up to his shoulders now, and he was still smiling. Even from the distance of several yards in the dark, Granddad somehow knew the man was still smiling. There was movement, and he saw the man lift his hand a third time, motioning for him to come back, to come closer, to come into the water. Granddad wasn't sure which, or even if it was any type of those things, and he never found out. Without a word, he turned to face the trees and walked away. He walked the seven miles home, unnerved and perplexed, and for the next 80 years until his death at the age of 91, he never figured out who the man was, why he was there, or what he wanted. Over and over again, he told us that story. The encounter clearly haunted him. It haunts me. I shudder to think what would have happened had my granddad actually gotten close to that man or lingered by the lake that night. But the one thing that has stuck out in my mind about this experience more than anything is that the man stood almost neck deep in water and didn't even make a ripple. Hello all. So, this story is based around an area that I've known very well since childhood. I've camped there twice as a kid and a few times as an adult. One of those times was at Camp Geronimo and I got bit by a bat. The first time as an adult was with my city slicker fiance, who is now my wife. She has never been camping before. A day or two before we left, I bought my first pistol, so I had to be 21. I'm going to say this was maybe 1998 or 1999. We went to Woods Canyon Lake in April at the start of the season to avoid the crush of people. Woods Canyon Lake is a man-made lake. It's also on the Mongolian Rim. The campground was well-developed and park-like. I normally like a more secluded place, but my fiancé was not looking to have a Jason Voorhees camping experience. We arrived late Friday night at around 11 p.m. My old beater car was having trouble due to the thinner air. I hadn't stopped to adjust the car in Payson. We select a spot and quietly tried to set up. It was quiet. Most people never understand when you say that but it was so quiet, it was loud. There are a few occupied campsites a few hundred yards away, and you could hear people breathing and snoring. It was also very dark. There was no moon or light pollution. Our lanterns cast a feeble glow, and it seemed like they barely pushed back the night. We must have sounded like a troop of elephants getting our tiny tent set up. We went to bed right away because we had worked all day and drove up from Phoenix without rest. My first fuck up was not realizing how cold it got at night and making sure our gear was good enough. We woke up at 3 a.m. shivering so hard we couldn't light a match or a lighter. I finally got the propane heater going on her in the tent and covered her with my sleeping bag and blanket so she wouldn't die. I lit and sat by the fire to get warm and drank coffee till the sun came up. I didn't notice anything odd except the unnatural quiet. No animal sounds or anything. The hiss of my stove as the coffee perked sounded like a jet engine. The next day was nice. We did stuff like fished and rowed a boat across the lake. Looking back, the entire north side of the lake was filled with weird tree structures. There was no easy access to that side of the lake. 
I felt uneasy rowing close to the shore on that side for some reason. The day ended with us exhausted and sunburned, so a good day. I made dinner of soup and boiled eggs on the camp stove as the sun set. We had just recently watched the Blair Witch Project, and I bought her the same hat the girl had, a powder blue stocking cap. We had an old school H18 video camera and made some parody videos while the food cooked. Hilarious. I drank a few beers and we ate. We put the fire out and headed to the tent for some rest. We had decided to sleep with our bags zipped together to share body heat. A smart choice. She fell asleep right away. For some reason, I don't get sleepy in the woods. Never have. I stayed up reading with a flashlight. We left one lantern burning low off to the left side of the tent. There was a camp far off to our right, and this night, they left a lantern on as well. I leave a lantern on because I'm a paranoid motherfucker and I want to see the silhouette of something if it enters my camp on the tent wall. I had my new gun next to me, a 9mm Lorsen. It's the crappiest gun I have ever owned, but it was cheap for a couple of poor kids just starting out. I'm reading something by Dean Coots when I notice something. It was quiet, and I mean dead quiet. I listened hard, straining to hear. All I could hear was the hiss of the lantern, my own breathing, and my tinnitus. What exactly caught my attention, I wondered. I couldn't sense anything, so I went back to reading. A few minutes later, I felt the same thing. There are bears in the Mongolian rim. We had cleaned up dinner well and put all the food and food trash in the car. Was it a bear? I briefly heard a baby fussing in the north and a mama soothing it. There was another camp about 300 yards north of us that had a baby. That's how quiet it was. That's when I noticed it. Something was pressing lightly against the top of the small A-frame tent over my head near the peak on the right side. Was it a branch? No, there were no branches in reach because people broke them off for firewood. There was no undergrowth or bushes in the entire site. What was pushing against my tent? I stayed calm and quiet and watched the spot. It started moving slowly toward my face. My hand crept slowly for my handgun. It didn't have a shape like a finger or a hand. I could hear it sliding down the cheap single layer of green nylon fabric with a low hiss. With my flashlight on, I could not see the light from the lantern or the other campers. I didn't want to douse my light and alert whoever it was that I detected what they were doing. At this point, I was sure it was a person. My wife was, and still is, a very beautiful young woman. She was a perv magnet with her long, luxurious blonde hair and slim figure. My hand wrapped around the grip of my 9mm, and I pretended to be getting comfortable. I even sighed. Well, this perv was about to have the scare of his life. The plan was to bark out at him and cock the gun and then burst out of the tent when I heard him run away and fire a few rounds into the woods or follow him to his camp. In one smooth motion, I pulled the slide back on the gun and pressed it to the depression in the tent fabric. I felt resistance. Something was there. You're fucking with the wrong people, friend. I said, or something equally one-liner-ish. I expected to hear a gasp or a curse or something. I heard nothing. The resistance faded as whatever it was backed off. Still, not a sound. A mouse farting would have sounded like a cannon. It was so quiet. I killed my light, 
the light from the distant camp's lantern illuminated the right side of my tent with a pale glow. It was clear, not even blocked by a tree or a branch. I whipped my head to the left, thinking I would see a skulking shadow on that side from my lantern. It was also clear. I laid there for many, many long minutes, straining to hear something, but there wasn't even a breath of wind or a cricket chirping. I decided to stay in the tent and not investigate. I didn't get any sleep that night. I laid there on high alert with my gun on my chest, listening. Finally, about an hour before dawn, the crickets started chirping along with the birds. I didn't get out of my tent until I heard the other campers stirring. I checked the entire campsite, but found no prints other than ours. No animal tracks, no scat, no sign anyone but us had been there. So I know about the weird stuff that goes on in that area. Turns out there have been Bigfoot sightings near the campground. We had fun that day, starting with a hearty breakfast of bacon and eggs. I didn't mention what happened to my fiance until later at home. She thought I'd want to stay another night because we had Monday off from work, but I told her I was tired. We broke camp around 4 p.m. and were on the road home before the sun set. What was touching my tent? Who knows? Whatever it was could move in near total silence. It was cautiously respectful of a firearm, but not scared. It could have moved and it could move and navigate in almost total darkness and leave no trace. I have camped in that area twice since then, and not in the last 15 or so years. Nothing strange had happened on those trips except to reinforce the strangeness of the first trip. The nights were always filled with noise, insects, animals, etc. Hell, one time we got chased into the tent early because a curious skunk kept roaming around. Anyway, that's my weirdest experience out in the middle of nowhere, titled Mongolian Rim. I've had a few paranormal experiences throughout my life, but this one popped up in my brain the other day, and I've been thinking about it a lot, and can't really explain what happened, so I thought I'd share. About two years ago, in the dead winter, my power went out. This was a big problem for me because I have a pet leopard gecko who requires heating elements to survive. It started getting very cold in my apartment, very quickly, to the point I became worried about my pet's safety and did the only thing I could think of to do, which was to take my gecko to my car and crank the heater up. Normally, we get a few power outages every winter in my area, and they last maybe an hour or two. This time was different because the power did not come back on for six hours. After about an hour sitting in my driveway, I got extremely bored and started driving around my neighborhood, which had some more rural areas that butted up against a national forest that's out in the middle of nowhere. One of these areas is an absolutely beautiful overlook where you can see miles of forest and also a few street lights. So I'd be able to see if the power came back on. So I drove there and parked to enjoy the view. I had the heat running for a while and the car had gotten a bit hot so I rolled down the window to let in some cool air and almost immediately started hearing something kind of far off at first. Kind of a weird sad sounding owl mixed with a squawk. I assumed this was an animal but rolled up the window almost all the way just in case. Over the next 20 minutes, the sound got progressively closer and closer to the car until it sounded like it was circling me. I can still hear this sound in my mind clear as day, even though this happened several years ago. And I know what animals 
we had locally and what they sounded like. This doesn't sound like any of them. I got nervous and decided to leave and go get some food and gas in the neighboring town that still had power. About another hour passes and there's still no power. Having convinced myself the sound was just an animal and it had probably long since moved on, I went back to the overlook to enjoy my meal. About another hour goes by without anything happening. No noise, no nothing. Until eventually, I see movement amongst the big rocks in front of me. It's starting to get dark, so I can't really make it out perfectly, but at one point it looked like the head of a disfigured animal peering over at me, over this rock, and then disappeared. I see this several more times, but I stay because if it was an animal there, there was something severely wrong with it be it an injury or a birth defect that would probably affect its quality of life. And I wanted to be able to let the animal control know so they could find it and help it or put it out of its misery, if necessary, since it was clearly staying in that exact area. After a while, it starts making noise again, the same one as before, but now it's also added this horrible gurgling and sounds almost human. At this point, it's gotten completely dark and I can't see much of anything, but I can still hear it circling the car. Eventually, I hear what sounds like something messing around near the back tire and I panic and peel out of the parking spot. I look behind me and see what is now very clearly a person in the taillight. They attempted to chase the car for a few feet but quickly gave up. Is it possible this was just a person under the influence or suffering from a mental health issue? Yeah, it definitely is. But that seems pretty unlikely since it was probably below 30 degrees outside and far enough out of everyone's way. I doubt anyone would be hanging out there let alone hanging out there for hours and wearing what appeared to be an animal skin on their head. If it wasn't a person, based on the location and how the thing looked, it had to be a skinwalker. This experience still terrifies me to this day. I believe I may have a recording of the sound that I will try to find later, if I can find it. I'll post it if I can. But due to the power outage, I didn't film or record most of the experience to conserve my already dying phone. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true middle-of-nowhere stories. I would like to give a very special shout-out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare. Chrissy Elias, The Sugar Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Doba Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Plates, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank all of you all so much for continuing to support Back to Ashes, for without you, there wouldn't be me, and there would not be a channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Summerlane is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.